Hey guys, welcome to the inaugural show, um, Small Ball, coming at you. Really excited to get going. I'm Tristan Salicito, um, and I'm really excited to bring you guys my sort of uh, my, my viewpoint and my take on, on Major League Baseball, and, and um, I think it's really important um, to sort of talk about some of the behind the scenes kind of under underappreciated aspects of the game because I feel like baseball at, at its core is uh, is under reported in the media and I think that um, you can't really blame um, you know the media and talk shows from under reporting baseball because that's not what appeals to the masses and and they got to do their job and, and keep their ratings up but um, I think us baseball fans um, deserve it and definitely want um, some more detailed uh, discussions around Major League Baseball and that's sort of why I decided to start this show and, and I'm really excited uh, about it. I'm really excited and I think that, um, you know, if, if, if one person, um, you know, it's kind of like that um, Spongebob meme that's circulating um, where it's, it's kind of like if one person is genuinely happy from <clears throat> from watching this show um, my job is done um, and and it would be great if I could get millions and millions of viewers but you know and that was something that was sort of holding me back from getting started with the show and it's an idea that I've had for a long time but um, you know I kind of felt like why bother um, you know why why go for it when you know it's gonna be like every other one of those shows you know on YouTube that it's getting you know, 35 views um, at most. But then I kind of, you know, I took a step back and I realized if if I can get five people to, to genuinely enjoy the show, then it's worth it for me. So uh, that's why I'm here and hopefully that serves um, that particular purpose. And uh, let's get rolling. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I was born and raised in the great city of New York. I'm a Yankee fan. Um, I'm not not particularly hardcore. I think I'm more a fan of a game, but uh, definitely uh, identify as a Yankee fan. So that that may come up, you know, as we go. Um, but in general, I just love the game. I love um, college, minor league, major league, um, and, and I've played the game for for quite some time. And I'm I'm super excited to to share my my opinions and my views. Um, and of course, you guys will probably have some of your own that you can, um, you know, maybe maybe comment and we can talk about. And I'll have a bunch of guests on the show, and it's going to be a fun time. So glad you're here. Thank you so much for for checking it out. Uh, I'm excited to get going. Speaking of getting going, uh, let's talk some baseball. So uh, arbitration is kicking into high gear, and today we saw Dodgers um, come to terms with Cody Bellinger. Um, avoiding arbitration, 11 plus million dollar deal for the 2020 season, um, and that's all well and great. Um, Cody Bellinger, I think, is a great player. I think that um, when he's when his arbitration is up, he'll he'll demand um, something in the ballpark of Mike Trout. Um, and I, I think he's worth I think he's worth every penny at this point from what I've seen. I think that he uh, you know he can do it all. He can hit. He can hit for power. Uh, he can field. He can throw. He he has. Um, I think I think he has a stellar attitude, um, and I think that uh, he can definitely be the best player on a on a World Series winning team. But um, when I saw that that news um, of Cody Bellinger um, getting signed today, it, it rose it arose some some thoughts in me about the Dodger, um, and I think that. I've I've been a I've been a bit of a Dodger hater for for a couple of years now, um, and I I really don't have um, that high of an opinion of them to be perfectly honest. I think that they're very overrated, overvalued, and um, I impressed myself by actually picking them to lose in the NLDS this year, um, and I think that their sort of the, the direction that they're heading in right now is not actually um, going to go going to put them on an upward trajectory I think that um, you know I think that if they keep on this path I think that uh, they're headed for more early exits and perhaps maybe not even postseason appearances 
And I came to the realization that um, there's a pretty good chance that Cody Bellinger's uh, post-arbitration contract is not going to be with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, whether he signs elsewhere, whether he's traded before before that point, um, from what I've seen, I can definitely um, foresee the Dodgers spiraling out of control by that by that time. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I think that they're terrifically um, they're terrifically sort of similar um, and, and very sort of rigid um, in their, especially offensively. I mean, I think, you know, when I, when I find myself watching the Dodgers, I feel like every time I turn around, I'm like, oh, Cody Bellinger's up again. And I'm like, oh, no, it's, it's Max Muncy or it's Jock Peterson or it's another left-handed bat that prioritizes loft and power over contact, which is, which is fine if you have one, maybe two of those guys. But the Dodgers have five, maybe six guys in their lineup in 2020 that all, to me, look very similar in Cody Bellinger, Jock Peterson, Corey Seager, uh, Max Muncy, Matt Beatty, Gavin Lux, if he ends up having becoming an integral part of that lineup. And I think that can win you a lot of regular season games, um, and it has over the last couple of years. But when you get to the postseason and you're not facing your, your everyday you know, third or fourth right-handed starter um, and, and you have to face elite uh, arms, like a like a Max uh, sorry, Max Scherzer, uh, Steven Strasburg, you struggle with without the kind of the diversity um, and the balance in in your lineup. Um, like I said, I think Cody Bellinger is an elite talent. I think that if you have Cody Bellinger as your um, as your you know three or four hitter, I think that's very productive. Um, but to have five other guys that are just like him, just a little bit worse. Or in a lot of cases, I think significantly worse. I don't think I don't think that that bodes well for you in a in a postseason series where you have to go up against Scherzer and Strasburg, two of the front line you know starters in this game. Um, so I mean, I, I think that, like I said, that can win you a lot of regular season games, and and I think it's almost kind of like fool's gold at this point. I think that. Um, you know, analytics will, will tell you that that's productive and, 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 it, and it works because, you know, uh, over a 162-game season, maybe that does carry over and, and, and give you a couple more wins. But, um, you know, when, when you boil it down to a five-game series against what looked to be an inferior team in the Washington Nationals, um, they didn't match up very well. Um, in that series, you um, I'm going to read you the, the strikeout totals for the Dodgers in those five games. 12, 17, 15, 8, and 12. You, you really can't win a series like that. Um, you can't have that little um, ability to put the ball in play and make things happen and, and expect to be um, a very good team. If I, in, you know, three out of five or four out of seven or whatever the case may be. So in my opinion, they have talent. And, and I think that they need to shuffle it up a little bit and maybe get another right-handed bat. I mean, Justin Turner is great, but to be perfectly honest, he's better against right-handed pitching than he is against left-handed pitching. So if you go, I mean, Strasburg and, and Cole and Verlander and, and Scherzer are all righties, but, you know, maybe, maybe you have to face, you know, you, luckily they have Clayton Kershaw and they had Hyunjin Ryu last year, but, you know, if you end up going up against a, a top-level left-handed pitcher, you're going to struggle even more so. Um, so, in their pitching, I mean, I think Walker Buehler is, is legit. I think that he's the real deal. Um, Clayton Kershaw is the best regular regular season pitcher I've ever I've ever watched pitch. Um, but at this point, you can't you can't really consider him an elite pitcher in the postseason. I mean, I think what we've seen is that is that pitchers are are what they are in the regular season, and they are what they are in the postseason, and, and there are a lot of Examples where that's not similar in any way, and at this point, I don't consider Clayton Kershaw to be an elite pitcher in October, and I think a lot of people would agree. So, um, you know, assuming he's an average pitcher, or he may be even worse, because that's 
that's essentially what he is post September. Um, I think the Dodgers have won now that they, they I mean, Hyunjin Ryu uh, has gone to the Blue Jays. They have one elite pitcher. So you're, you're going into um, a series with one elite arm. A lot of the contending top level teams have two. And you're going Sorry, in I didn't quite with catch that. Uh, Could you please repeat a, a lineup that, that kind of struggles against that level of, of competition. So, um, you know, it's. Huh? I'm not sure I'm hearing you correctly. My apologies. Wow. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, it doesn't bode well for them, um, in my opinion. And, and I think that they got to mix it up. You know, I think it's tough because you can't really, you know, just get rid of um, your talent. And they have talent. But personally, the Dodgers to me are a playoff team, but I don't think Cody Bellinger is going to um, stick around. I think he's going to be a little bit um, fed up at that point. And, and maybe I'm wrong, but personally, that's how I feel about the Bellinger situation. And, and, and that would be tough to waste talent like that. But um, I think that's where they stand. You know, I think that's where they stand right now. Um, so again, it's you know, I think it's kind of like fool's gold. Like I said, like you can you can win a hundred plus you know regular season games, but I think their roster as is is not capable of winning a championship. Um, so I think that they got to try to mix it up. Uh, Jack Peterson honestly has impressed me. I mean, I, I mean, I'm I'm very anti. Um, strikeouts but over the last season he only had 111 strikeouts in 149 games hit 249 which in today's day and age is, is perfectly reasonable 876 OPS with 36 home runs he's always had the power so um, you know I think that that's something that, that surprised me and, and impressed me a little bit about about Jock Peterson but all in all it, again like I watch the Dodgers and I'm just like you know what I thought Cody Bellinger just hit and you know it's not i mean it's it's speedy or it's it's muncie or lux or whatever um so i think that i think that lack of, of diversity and balance is, is really going to hurt them and like we saw in, in this in this postseason series against the nationals like 12 17 15 8 and 12 their strikeout numbers like i said before so that's you can't you really can't expect to beat uh the nationals like that um so I mean that's you know it's it's unfortunate for me because I'm a big Cody Bellinger fan. I like Cody Bellinger, and, and but I can't see him sticking around. I really can't. Um, so moving on, that sort of segues a little bit into um, my so this is um, so it's, it's early to mid January, and I'm gonna come at you guys with some postseason predictions um, or or well regular season predictions heading into the postseason. Um, and we're gonna, you know, sort of, as we go um, leading up to and during the season, we're gonna update these, but I'm gonna give you these right now just so we can see um, sort of where I'm at at this point and, and, and go from there. But these might surprise you, a little, uh, surprise you a little bit. I mean, we we do not do, we do not do chalk on this show. Um, we, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit controversial, um, but you know that's just this is how we're gonna roll. Um, so maybe a couple surprises on this list, but I'm just gonna bring it right at you. I think that the Yankees are the number one seed to me in the American League. Um, that's not particularly surprising, I I, I would assume. But um, loaded lineup, loaded pitching staff, beyond loaded bullpen. Um, you know, a hundred, hundred and three game winner last year, added what I think is the best player in baseball in Garrett Cole, um, and you know I think that I think they're on a, a fast track um, to the number one seed, um, and I think the number two seed and the AL Central winner is going to be the Twins. Um, I think that to me. They're an absolute lock for the AL Central. I think that the White Sox are far from ready um, to contend for a for a division title. Um, talk about strikeouts and you know, lack of a balanced lineup. 
I mean, you, you have, I think they have four or five guys that could lead the league in strikeouts this year, and Moncada and Jimenez, and, and I mean, Grand, Grandal is a great pickup, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, they, that's a team that could definitely lead the league in strikeouts, and they're young, too. I mean, Moncada has not come into his own yet. Jimenez, obviously, you know, terrific talent, but, you know, we, we got to kind of wait and see. Um, Tim Tim Anderson is another guy that um, you know does some good things, but you know has a lot of swing and miss in his game. Um, so to me, I love the Grandal pickup. Um, I think that Keuchel as well is a good, a really good signing, but they are far from ready in my opinion. I don't, I can't see them contending for a um, for a division title. I think the Indians. I I'm surprised by their. Um, decision to look to you know rebuild and, and and what have you. I think that they actually might have more talent than the Twins, um, but you know, I just think their culture right now is is not focused on winning. And, and you know they just lost Kluber. They might lose Lindor, and their bullpen is very questionable. Um, they lost Bauer last year, so I think the the Twins are clear front runner for the AL Central. I think they'll be the number two seed, and I think that they also are going to pick up a lot of um, regular season wins in the AL Central, within the AL Central, because you got the Tigers, you got the Royals, who are probably going to, you know, they have an opportunity to pick up a lot of wins against those teams. And, you know, you look at the AL Central, I mean, excuse me, the AL West, um, pretty deep division. The AL East has, you know, the Yankees and the Rays and the Red Sox. So uh, the Blue Jays are, are on the upswing. So. Um, I think that the AL Central is, is the weakest division, and that's why I think the Twins definitely will outdo the AL West winner um, for that number two spot. And again, seeding, you know, especially in baseball, is, is not terrifically important, but um, I guess for our predictions, they're somewhat important because, uh, you know, we've got to see if we can be perfect. But speaking of the AL West winner, I have the Oakland A's. Um, coming out of the AL West. Um, I think the Astros, at this point, have more talent than the Oakland A's. Um, they lost their best player. Um, their their rotation is still good, but not great. Um, Verlander, you know, was not quite himself in the postseason. I still think he's a great pitcher. Probably, I mean, definitely top five, maybe even top three in the MLB. Um and then you got Granky, who who's kind of you know hot and cold against great teams, um, and then the back end could be whatever you know some collection of Urquidy um, or McCullers if he's healthy. So um, you know I guess I guess we'll kind of see, but it, it's not a deep rotation. Their bullpen is mediocre. Um, you know you got Ozuna. They they lose um, they lose Will Harris. Um, so I think that. Their lineup is deadly. I mean, I mean, you got just talent all over the place. But to me, coming off this cheating scandal, um, you know, I, this is sort of like a, a roundabout kind of indirect um, sort of um, implication, the, the cheating scandal. But I, I think they're going to have a hard time recovering from that, um, whether that be because they, you know, have to adapt a new... I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe you know, a large part of their success is due to uh, the advantage that they had in their home ballpark. And I, and I think, you know, taking that out of the equation, they're still an elite offense. But maybe they, you know, maybe they struggle without um, that advantage. And I just think every team is going to be gunning for them. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be tough to... Um, to maintain that level of success, they had a heartbreaking loss in the World Series. You know, they've they've played um, back. They've been in back-to-back -back World Series. So I mean, we see this a lot in basketball, um, where or even football. Football, actually, even more so than basketball, where you get these deep playoff runs. You're, you're not quite ready to go at the beginning of the season because you're still, you know, that kind of throws off the uh, spring training rhythm, and you're a little bit, you know, a little bit tired from the previous season so it's um I just think there's a lot of things that sort of line up against the Astros this year and um I still think they're a playoff team of course they're my number one wild card spot but um I think the A's are going to take it 
the ALOS. I think they're very talented. I think they have a lot of young players that are that are um, on the rise, like Luzardo and AJ Puck. Um, and I think I think Franklin Barreto could actually have sort of his, his breakout uh, season. Um, defensively, they're the, they're the best team in Major League Baseball. I mean, you got um, you got Chapman and, and Semyon on the left side of the infield, which is just absolutely killer. Uh, defensively, I think Matt Olson is, is very solid. You got Oriano in center is, is tremendous. If Sean Murphy ends up being the starting catcher, he's one of the better um, defensive catchers in the league, I think, even in his rookie year. and He might even lead the league in, in caught dealing percentage. His arm is that good. but um, And offensively, there's nothing to sneeze at either. I mean, Semyon was a runner-up for MVP. Chapman could be this year as well. And um, they're just loaded all over the place. I mean, their rotation, I mean, is is balanced. It's not, there's no really real superstar caliber, but you got Mike Fires, Luzardo, I think, I mean, remains to be seen whether he'll be in the bullpen or the rotation. AJ Puck, same story, but um, I think they're very balanced. I think they're very um, deep, and I think that they're going to win the AL West. And like I said, I got the Astros um, wild card one. There's just there's just too much talent for them to miss the playoffs, um, and they could even they could even take take the division of course, but to me I mean they're the number one wild card and the number two wild card is gonna surprise you. I've been hearing a lot of White Sox or Indians, um, or even maybe like an Angels depending on how they fill out the rest of their roster. Um, I've heard some Rays. I got the Red Sox. Um, the only thing I don't like about the Red Sox is sort of the, the mentality, sort of like the Indians, um, of this sort of like retool, retooling um, mentality that they're sort of coming into the season with. But they have, I mean, their lineup is, I think, is as good as any, I mean, really, honestly, in, in Major League Baseball, um, all over the place. They got bats, they can play defense. Their pitching, their starting pitching, um, it could it could be better for sure, um, but Chris Sale, oh you know every year has an opportunity to win the Cy Young and their bullpen I think is a little bit underrated you know I think um, you know a guy like Ryan Brazier um, had a bit of a down year I think he can um, sort of surprise some people this year um, they don't have you know obviously that like top top of the line um, closer but they made it work last year with like a, you know Brandon Workman and and Brazier and sort of piecing it together and um, so they're gonna give up runs but they're they're gonna score a lot of runs and I think that bodes well for the regular season um, not sure they'll make it you know past uh, past that wild card game and definitely don't think they're gonna take the division but to me at this point I have the Red Sox um, as the last team uh, in the AL making the making the playoffs and it's, um, I like the Red Sox um, roster as a whole I mean I think you know if you balance the the great offense with the you know less than ideal pitching staff you know it can be it can make for some challenges I think pitching is always kind of the um, sort of the benchmark and I think that you know without top of the line pitching it's hard to win championships of course but uh, I think they're gonna win a lot of regular season games um, so personally I got the Red Sox and let's move up move on rather to the naturally this is where it gets kind of Kind of interesting. Um, the Braves, to me, are the best team in the National League, and it's not close. Um, I think that they're going to be the number one seed. I think that they're going to be. I mean, they're they're going to continue to improve for the next three or four years. Um, they're super young, but still have some experience. I mean, they were in the postseason last year. They have, you know, you got Acuna, you got Albies, you got Swanson. Um, all these young players and pitchers too. I mean, Soroka and, and, and Freed, and um, I think you know they got a lot of young players that aren't that don't play like young players, um, if that makes sense. And they got some old players too that can still play. Freddie Freeman, in my estimation, is the best first baseman in Major League Baseball. Um, you know, Marquez can definitely still hit. Um, defensively, they're really good too. Um, Swanson is is an elite, you know, is, a, is an elite six. Albies is really good at, at second. Um, NCRT is, is tremendous in center field. So, um, catching situation, you know, they got to, uh, you know, I think they, they signed Travis Darno um, in the offseason. So, I mean, you know, that is what it is. But 
Um, and, and losing Josh Donaldson um, is going to hurt. But if they can re-sign him for sure, I mean, they're – but, um, you know, I think they'll definitely address um, address third base either way. Um, so I think the Braves, to me, are the number one seed. Um, the number two seed. And the winner of the NL Central, I have the Cincinnati Reds. Um, it was a tough choice between the Reds and the Cardinals for the um, – the NL Central and spoiler, spoiler alert: the Cardinals are um, the number one wild card team, so they're still making the playoffs in my in my predictions. But the Cincinnati Reds are uh, they're ready. I mean, they they have a lot of talent. I think they're going to be the surprise of uh, of this of the twenty twenty season. I mean, every year there's kind of that like surprise team. And, um, I think they're. I mean, the pitching is great. They added Bauer. Louis Castillo looks like he can be a top line, uh, top line starter. Um, Wade Miley was kind of an under the radar pickup that I really liked. Um, their bullpen is also loaded with Garrett, and 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 they got. I mean, they they they're just they just throw hard. I mean, they got the bullpen starting rotation. They have guys that can really, um, really light up the radar gun. Offensively, you know, they add Mustakas, which is. Awesome. I think Joey Votto still got a lot left in the tank. I think that he's getting to be underrated, in my opinion. I don't think he's really lost um, too much of his game. Um, and I think that you know you got Suarez at the hot corner. I think that I just think that they have a lot of talent that that's kind of been um, you know a little bit suppressed over the last couple of years, and they've been rebuilding and kind of throwing together some, you know, sort of the chemistry isn't always there because you're changing the team, you're calling up prospects, but um, they're loaded. I think they're going to win the NL Central. Um, I really do. And, you know, that's, that's kind of my sleeper pick of, of these uh, predictions. But, um, yeah. Uh, so third seed, I got the, I got the Dodgers. Um, you know, I said my piece about the Dodgers, you know how I feel about them, but uh, to me, the NLS is not great. No, it's worse than not great. It's it's bad. Um, I think that the Dodgers are going to win. Like I said, you know they're going to be able to win some regular season games, and and they're going to think they're going to get back to the postseason. Um, Dodgers Reds would be a pretty fun um, uh, NLDS, but um, personally, I think uh, they're going to get back there, and you know. You heard what I had to say about the Dodgers, you know, I think wouldn't shock me if, you know, they have a, a, a down year, but um, I don't think they're going to be any higher than, than the third seed. And like I said, the Cardinals are the number one wild card team to me. Um, they, they really impressed me last year. Um, upsetting the Braves, obviously the, um, you know, the NLCS did not go particularly well for St. Louis, but... Um, I think that Mike Schultz has done a really good job. Um, I think that they're really deep. Um, I think that Miles Mikolas even had a down year. I still think he's their ace. I think that he can be, um, you know, I think he can return to his, his peak form. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, their staff is good. They had Jack Flaherty and Miles Mikolas. That could be, you know, a, a really, really good uh, one-two punch. And they can hit and, and play defense as well. Um, Tommy Edmond was a was a really cool surprise last year. Um, you know they got. I mean, when you think about the Cardinals, like it seems like every year the Cardinals, no matter who's on their team, no matter you know who, who what they have um, at their disposal, they always find a way to win a lot of games and win playoff games too. In many cases, um, they're just one of those um, sort of blue blood cultures in the MLB and. I think that now they even have a lot of a lot of really good talent. Um, Yachty's still behind the dish, which is you know I mean he's definitely not quite the player he once was, but um, I think that he's you know it's he's a really good leader, really good defensive catcher still. I mean he's kind of you know kind of falling off a little bit unfortunately, but um, still really fun to watch. Goldschmidt is is an elite elite first baseman. Um, and I think I, I think that the Cardinals are gonna um, be you know pretty pretty similar to what what they were last year. And then the um, second wild card in the NL, um, I had a lot of trouble with this one, and I got the Arizona Diamondbacks. 
making a return to the postseason this year. Um, and that might surprise some people. I So I think the Phillies are a better team, to be perfectly honest, than the Diamondbacks. But what it comes down to for me is the Phillies have to play in the deepest, maybe even best division in baseball. Um, obviously, the Marlins are, are a mess, but honestly, they're, they're probably going to be better than they were last year. And they actually weren't as much of a joke as, as many people thought they would be last year. But the Phillies have to play the Mets, who are, you know, not going to make the postseason. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. But um, they're a very good team that can win, you know, a lot of games. Um, they got to play the Braves. You know, like I said, they, you know, the Braves are just loaded. Um, and they and, and and of course the the Washington Nationals, which you know defending World Series champions. Um, so to me, honestly, I think the Phillies are a better team um, than the than the, um, the Diamondbacks. But the Diamondbacks, I think, are going to win more regular season games. I think that in the NL West is weak. I think the Giants are going to be an absolute disaster this year. Um, I think that the Rockies. They just seem to underperform every year, um, and and I think the Padres sort of a similar situation, um, and the Dodgers, like I said, are are significant. I mean, you know, you got the Braves at the top of the NL East, the Dodgers at the top of the NL West. You know, the Braves scare me a lot more than the Dodgers do. So, I think that the D-backs are actually going to make it back to the postseason. Adding Madison Bumgarner, keeping Robbie Ray, they have a lot of. Um, like break like every year they have like a really like a breakout player like that nobody saw coming. Obviously that's what breakout player means. Um, but uh, yeah, Ketel Marte they got Eduardo Escobar. I mean they Carson Kelly. I mean they like I, like I don't know how they didn't make the uh, postseason last year. I mean they 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 really have a lot of talent. They can hit um, and and you know. Adding Bumgarner and now Ray, that's two left-handed um, pitchers. And I think in the postseason, Madison Bumgarner is still an elite pitcher. If he, you know, I mean, he's like I said, pitchers in the regular season and, and pitchers in the in the postseason are you, you might as well have a different name. I mean, you're not the same. Um, so, you know, I think if the Diamondbacks end up playing the Dodgers in a in a series, however that may line up whether that's the DS, the CS, whatever that may be, the wild card game, maybe even. But I guess that's not possible because then I guess the Padres or um, Rockies would have to win the division. But Matt Bumgarner and Ray, and, and I think that the Diamondbacks line up really well um, in that series, even against the Braves. I mean, I mean, I think their pitching can, you know, I think their pitching, their starting rotation is scary in the postseason, especially you know, two great lefties and they can hit and they're just going to get better, it looks like, this year. So I have the Diamondbacks. I mean, the Phillies are a good team, um, obviously. And I think the Brewers could even, you know, make a make a push. And um, the Cub, I mean, the Cubs are, I mean, they're like the, they're like the Indians and the Red Sox with a little bit less talent and, and a lot. I mean, their pitching is comparable to the Red Sox, I guess, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's possible that the Cubs make it back there, and maybe the Padres have a breakout year. And you know, I said, you know, I talked about the Mets a little bit, but the Mets. So I mean, you know, say what you want about the Mets, um, they have a shot. But and the Nationals, of course. Um, but personally, I think the Nationals are going to miss Rendon a lot. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Strasburg, you know, maybe doesn't play the whole season. Um, Scherzer was a little bit, you know, disappointing to be perfectly honest to me last year. I think coming into 2019, I had him as definitely the top pitcher in, in Major League Baseball, and um, I think he may be on the decline. So I think they're going to miss Rendon more than they think, um, and signing Donaldson would be huge. This this list could change a lot depending on what happens with Josh Donaldson, but um, as it stands right now, I I have the Diamondbacks. Uh, and the Phillies over the Nationals. Um, I think the Phillies, I think Bryce Harper, um, I'm not a Bryce Harper fan, um, you know, as a person, like, you know, I'm not trying to attack his character or anything, but um, I've never met the guy, but as a baseball player, um, 
you know, I think, I mean, maybe not even overrated anymore. I'm not sure how highly people think of him. I think, you know, his contract kind of <laughs> upset some people, but, um, you know, I think that, I think he's kind of maturing and, and I think he's, um, as a player and as a person, and I think um, he's still a very, very good, productive player. Um, Real Muto is the best catcher in baseball, and I don't think it's close. Um, their pitching could be really good if you know if Arietta has a bounce back year. And, um, I think that they, you know, Nola has been kind of up and down, so they have you know some pieces. They added um, they added Zach Wheeler, who's kind of questionable. So I think depending on how those three guys and, and you know they. They they're all kind of up and down, but maybe they, um, you know, I think if they're if they're all kind of clicking, then um, they might be able to do that. But like I said, the NL East is, is a brutal division, and I think that um, that's why I have the D back um, back in the postseason, um, and that could be really cool seeing Bumgarner back in the postseason and, and sort of a, a fresh start uh, in that regard. But um, yeah, so that's that's what we got. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it's mid-January, early to mid-January, but um, that's what we got right now. We're going to update those, of course, but um, we're going to come back to these. These will be like my, uh, you know, my, my OG um, predictions. So, yeah, we're going to come back to that. But moving on, um, I want to talk a little bit about, and, and, and I think, I mean, it, you know, something that, that is really... Um, always intrigued me and interested me um, is coaching um, and I think there's a lot of talk um, maybe like over the last couple of weeks about um, coach hirings in the NFL um, and, and I think you know we had a pretty um, pretty interesting um, managerial firing hiring cycle uh, this past offseason and I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna grade um, the hiring, it, all eight um, managerial hirings this off season, and and I'm gonna sort of include um, and, and address the the firings in there as well in, in that grade, and, and you know maybe if there was a firing that I liked or didn't like, I'm gonna sort of that's gonna color uh, the grade a little bit, but um, primarily focusing on on the hirings and and obviously I think you know baseball of the four major sports is where coaching definitely matters the least um but I think I don't think anybody would say that it's irrelevant I mean, no I think a lot of people would um disagree that it's irrelevant um and I think it matters more than people think so and that's always interested me is like when managing you know manager is the kind of thing where it's like you don't really have an opinion until you until you need to and then all of a sudden you have an opinion and, and that's sort of like one of my pet peeves um is like people a lot of people sort of proclaim themselves to be experts on you know a particular manager and um it, you know it's and we don't really get down to the nitty-gritty of, of really what's going on and you know people just take the win loss record and you know they try to compare it with the talent of the team and obviously that's a factor but um the three things to me about you know being a good manager um, I think you got to um, get your team ready to play at its fullest. Um, I think that's the number one thing to me is, you know, these are Major League Baseball players. They know how to play. Um, I think that a, man a great Major League manager to me gets its team um, playing at its full potential. And, and you know, there's various ways, obviously, of doing that and managers of all shapes and sizes um, and personalities you know are able to have success in the MLB but to me that's you know something that I mean like like think about it like think about all the conversations about managers that you've had and it's like nobody has any clue what's going on until you know the topic comes up and all of a sudden you know you have um, like a book report ready to go on Aaron Boone or, or whoever um, so I'm going to, I'm going to grade these guys. Oh, so, so, I mean, to me, managing, manage, managing in the major league baseball, very different at, at all different levels, but to me, getting your team ready to play, um, I think that, you know, g game management is, is important, but you know, it, it's, I mean, who really knows? I mean, you know, you, you praise a, a manager for making the right decision and you crush him for making the wrong decision. And it's like, who really knows? I mean, it, it's hindsight 2020 and all that, but um, I think 
to me, the second most important thing behind getting your team ready to play is, is maintaining a consistent approach. Um, and I think that, you know, as I think as long as you kind of know where your head's at and, and you're mature and, and you, you know, you make your decisions the way that, that you decide you want to make them. And you don't make, you know, um, it's not, it's not even like a gut or non-gut thing to me. It's, it's kind of like, if you, you like, I feel like a great manager has to sort of come to terms with what he wants, how he wants to run his team, um, and then go execute that. Um, I think the bad managers in a lot of cases are the ones that lose sight of, of their approach. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes they make decisions, you know, in a panic or they, they want a lot of, t there's a lot of talk about like over managing and trying to sort of like prove something and, and, and do something when it's not necessary. But um, to me, it, it's not about book versus non-book. I think managing with your, you know, I think everybody would agree that it's, a, you know, there's a balance between managing with your gut and managing with the analytics and the stats. Um, I lean more towards the gut than, than most people nowadays, but it's obviously a balance, um, but to me, as long I think that a good manager has to have a very clear identity and, and sort of approach to how he wants to, you know, make his changes and his lineups and all that, and then go out and and really do that. Um, so that's the, you know that's number two, and and number three is um, I mean so so two is kind of maturity. Maturity kind of goes along with that. Like you don't want to have a guy that's kind of a loose cannon, and like I said, just kind of makes decisions that don't coincide with who they want to be. Um, and number three is, is I mean, game management is, um, you know, you want to have knowledge of the game and, and experience. Um, you know, game management is, you know, a large part of that is understanding the game of baseball. And I think part of that is, is you know, intelligence and, and, and knowledge, but also experience. Um, and that doesn't have to be managing experience. It could be, you know, could be experience as a player it could be experience as a scout it could be experience in various different ways but to me I want a guy that that knows what he's doing knows the game and, and has sufficient experience um, so let's get down to these grades um, we're gonna give a letter grade to to each of the eight um, firings and hiring so start off with the Mets um, firing Mickey Callaway hiring Carlos Beltran um, I've met Carlos Beltran. Um, he's a very he's a, he's a great guy. Um, to me, this is a um, an emotional hiring. Um, it's you know it's kind of a feel good thing for the fans, and you bring back a, a Mets legend, a great player. So you know must be a great manager. To me, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you got a, a, you got a Mets team right now that is looking to win now right and and has pretty solid talent but but i think is sort of in that gray area um and is, is toying with that line of postseason teams where a manager a good manager can really put them over the edge and i think there's a lot of teams um with the yankees for example that you know you can you could have you know you can have a chimpanzee managing you know the yankees and they might still win 110 games but um I think that, to me, the Mets are a team that I think it really, I think it's really important that they get the right guy. And Carlos Beltran, I mean, I don't know anything about him as a manager, obviously. I mean, he's a first-year manager, but it doesn't make any sense to me. you got a team that's looking to win now, and you bring in a rookie, inexperienced manager. Um, and, and, you know, you bring in a guy, I mean, I would have liked to see them bring in a seasoned vet because, I mean, Carlos Beltran would fit with, like, you know, the Pirates or the Royals or a team that's kind of looking to grow and, and, and learn, and, and that's what Carlos Beltran could have done alongside them. But to bring in a rookie manager, you have no idea how he's going to do you have no idea what he's like as a, as a coach and teacher and all that. And you bring him in and you say, Carlos, we want to win a World Series. I mean, that's it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and again, I mean, I, I, I have nothing against the guy, Carlos Beltran, and he might be a great manager. But to me, 
this is kind of like a, a feel good hire and, it, and it's not a good one in my personal opinion um so i'm gonna give them a c minus because i do think he's you know i, I mean a lot of great players go on to be great managers and he could be great and i have nothing against the guy i think that um he's he could be great so it's it's no lower than a c minus because it could work but um i really just don't get it i really don't understand um why they wouldn't go out and try to get an experienced you know proven manager and we'll talk about some of those options you know as we go but um to me it's a c minus for the Mets. The Philadelphia Phillies fired Gabe Kapler and hired Joe Girardi. Um, I like this hiring a lot. Um, like I said, I'm a Yankee fan. I've, you know, a lot of experience with Joe Girardi as a manager, and you know, kind of as a his character as well. I think that he is. Um, I think he's a great manager. I think he has a very good um, sort of temperament and. Um, He's a you know, former catcher, and we've seen a lot of former catchers go on to be great managers. There's a couple on this list, in fact. Um, and to me, I think that to, you, you bring in a guy, and Joe Girardi, he's a very experienced manager with managing experience. He was manager of the year in 2003. He was a, 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 he was a longtime catcher, um, and, and I think that you bring in a guy who knows the game, who has great temperament, who's going to be able to sort of use to his advantage the sort of personalities, sort of the, the colorful personalities of a Bryce Harper. Um, you know, Real Muto is a superstar player. Um, you know, you got kind of all over the place you got. Uh, the Phillies over the last couple of years have been kind of like like a show, I mean, to me. I mean, I think they have a lot of talent, and, and, and I'm not taking anything away from their characters. Um, you know, like like in a, a Dubal Herrera and um, just kind of guys that that like to you know express themselves and Bryce Harper they add into the mix and it's um, you know it's something that I think you need a guy like that with you know that that sort of patience you know and that experience and um, to use that to his advantage rather than you know sort of set it aflame so um, and you bring in a great manager a great proven manager I mean the Yankees didn't win a World Series in, in this past decade, but they actually had the most regular season wins of any team. You know, two years ago, they, they went to the, um, they went, they were a game away from the World Series with uh, essentially what was a rebuilding team under Joe Girardi. I could, I really could not believe the, the firing. It, that, it's kind of like a, um, like a mandatory retirement kind of thing where he, you know, he kind of served his, his, his dues, um, and just had been there for what they thought was too long and they felt like making a move. But I really um, did not like that firing. And I think, you know, Gabe Kapler, you know, struggled and we'll get to him in a second, but um, I think it's a huge upgrade for him, for them rather, the Phillies. That to me is, a, is an A, it's an A. Um, you know, I think Girardi's stepped away from the game. That's the only kind of um, uh, sort of knock that I have is that he's been away from the game for a couple of years now, um, but you know I think I think he's going to do really well, and I'm excited to see what what they can do with that team. Yeah, that that's one of the most interesting teams in baseball to me. Um, moving on, the Padres uh, they fired Andy Green, which I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about. They they hired Jace Tingler, um, so Andy Green to me. Um, I think my gut tells me that, that he's a good manager. Um, he just didn't have the production. And I think that, you know, I understand the firing. I maybe, you know, I definitely could have seen them, you know, keeping that relationship going a couple more years. Um, but I get it. You know, he, you know, Andy Green to, to me reminds me a lot of Sean McVay. I think they look alike. I think they are both sort of like a young next gen kind of coach. Um, and to me, he, always, he he had a good sort of impression on me, and I think that um, you know, I, I was kind of sad to see him let go, but just didn't have the production, and so I get it. And I don't know a lot about Jace Tingler, um, you know, former assistant GM of the Texas Rangers, but from what I've seen, you know, in interviews and, and 
articles that I've read about him, he has a very, um, I'm ve I've, I was impressed uh, with his approach to the game, and, and he seems very old school, um, you know, very sort of, um, you know, kind of scrappy, kind of, you know, anti, um, you know, analytics movement, not anti-analytics movement, but, um, you know, he, he's, he's kind of, he's not, um, an analytical kind of guy from what I understand uh, about him so I, I think I think he could be a success um, in San Diego but again I don't I don't know anything really about him as a manager um, but I, I, I think it makes sense like like I think if the Mets bring him in I'm like I'm, I'm like what are you, like like really guys like what's going on here but um, the Padres needed a fresh start they have a young team that's I don't think they're ready to, to contend this year at all um, so you have a manager that can come in and and grow alongside you know Fernando Tatis and all the young players that they have, um, and I think that I think that's you know I think it's I think it's a good move for them. Um, the issues that I have I have two issues with with it. I mean, well, one of the issues is just that I you know I don't know anything about, um, and I'm not sure that the Padres do either. So I mean that's you know it's kind of like a an inexperienced kind of thing. But the other thing is. Um, I'm not sure he quite has the temperament from what I understand and, and, and he's a rookie manager so it's going to take some time to sort of vibe but to you know it, well, they got a Manny they got Manny Machado they got they got you know some superstar talent you had Tommy Pham to the mix who um, you know he's, he's a very good player um, he sort of he called out the Rays when he was back in Tampa Bay for their, their fan base and it just kind of like a lot of like sort of you know, you got Fernando Tatis Jr. is going to be one of the one of the you know, elite young players of the next couple of years at least. So, um, I think it's a it's sort of the, similar to the Phillies kind of vibe to me, where it's kind of like a um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and I'm not sure a rookie manager um, is is quite the best option for that. And he's also he also sort of seems to be very sort of laid back and. Um, to me, at least. So, you know, to me, it's a B. Um, I'm, I, I kind of like it. Um, but again, you know, I, I, I guess it, we'll see, kind of. But, um, you know, I think there were better options for them, um, which we'll get to as we go. But um, to me, it's a B. I think it's a solid choice, and then I have them at a B. Um, the Royals fired, or did not fire, but Ned Yost uh, retired. Um, you know, he had a great career, with, a great tenure with the Royals, won them a World Series, which was super impressive um, given their, you know, their market and, and, and what have you and their sort of their history, but the recent history, I should say. But hiring Mike Matheny. And Mike Matheny, um, Mike Matheny is a great manager. I mean, he, he, he set the record, um, or, or not the record, but the uh, he was the fourth um, manager for, the, for St. Louis to – managing a thousand games um, he had a nice long career with them he was the first ever manager um, in major league history actually to to make the playoffs in his first four seasons um, so he has a great track record um, he you know he was really good with the Cardinals organization and that culture and like you know sort of old school and you know go, doing the right thing and going about you know the game the right way and all that but um, I, I mean there's nothing I don't like about Mike Matheny. Um, and I like the hire a lot. The only thing is I think it's sort of like the opposite of the Mets sort of thing. Um, I think that they they might have actually benefited more from bringing in a guy that they could take a chance on, like a younger, inexperienced manager um, to sort of grow. And they have a lot of time. I mean, the Royals do before they're – able to contend in my estimation so um you know they're definitely a rebuilding you know retooling kind of team so i wouldn't have hated you know bringing in a younger like a like a jace tingler kind of kind of thing but um good hiring i think i give him a b as well um just because i think he's a great manager but it's like the, the fit doesn't really make a lot of sense to me so that's a b um the, okay, the Pirates um, dismissed Clint Hurdle and hired Derek Shelton. Now, I again, you know, I have very little knowledge about Derek Shelton as a manager, but he's bounced around 
um, team to team. As he was the uh, most recently with the Twins, the bench coach. And he's been on the uh, he's been in the organization rather the Blue Jays, the Indians, the Rays. Um, he caught in the minor leagues for the Yankees. Unfortunately, was um, his career ended with an arm injury. Um, so maybe he could have been a, a um, you know a major leaguer, but. Um, from what I understand, again, I mean, it's sort of like the Jay Stingler, you know, kind of thing where it's like, you know, we, I guess we have to wait and see, but to me, it makes a lot of sense for the Pirates because like the Royals, they're rebuilding, they can bring in, you know, Derek Shelton, who they can take a chance on, you know, not risking a lot, um, you know, if the, you know, if a, if a contending team brings in a rookie manager, um, you know, you have to sort of know, um, no idea how he's going to do that can be very risky but i think it makes a lot of sense for the pirates um so i like the hiring again i i, I just i don't know much about it i from what i understand and what i'm hearing he was um actually in line for the twins job before it ultimately went to rocco baldelli but and you know i think the world of, of rocco baldelli so um but from what i'm hearing baldelli and, and other managers and, and coaches and, and whatnot around the league uh, very uh, good things to say about Derek Shelton, um, so I, I like it. Um, to me, it's a it's a B plus. Um, I think the fit is great. Um, he's he's you know he's experienced. He's done a lot of coaching, and you know if he's a rookie manager on a like a rookie quote unquote kind of team, so um, I like the fit a lot. I think it makes a lot of sense. Don't know much about him, so I guess we'll have to wait and see. But to me, it's a B plus. Um, so the Cubs, okay, the Cubs, they let go of Joe Madden, um, who we will get to, and they hired David Ross, um, similar to the Mets, of course, hiring a former player, trying to sort of, you know, please the fan base in that sense. Um, but I don't mind it, actually. Um, former catcher, like we talked about, um, that seems to bode well for managers. And I, I think David Ross, you know, I, he, he was um, doing a lot of uh, broadcasting last year. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Obviously, you can't, you know, catch for a World Series winning team and, and not know the game of baseball. So... Um, I think it's I think it's a cool move because the Cubs are about to embark on a rebuild. Um, I think there's almost no denying that, and maybe not a full rebuild, maybe sort of like a rebuild while staying relevant kind of thing. But um, I think he can come in. He can he can you know sort of get his feet wet, and they're not going to contend this year. So I think that if if they do poorly, they can rebuild. If they do well, you know he you know he's off to a good start so um i like the fit obviously a former player somebody that the fan base respects um and i think a lot of people have a lot of respect for for david ross and um and i think it's really cool that they're giving him that opportunity um again don't know much at all about him as a manager and i i you know i i wouldn't have hated um bringing in a um an experienced sort of veteran manager because I still think they have the talent to um, to make a push for the postseason. Um, but I think the culture is weird, has been weird there ever since winning the World Series. It feels like they like they won their World Series and now they're kind of like you know just chilling. But um, that's what it feels like to me at least. So I think bringing in a really good, uh, experienced manager could sort of set that fire and, and get them back into the postseason so I'm not sure about the kind of like let's rebuild let's bring in David Ross and kind of you know work work from there um so to me it's a B um because I don't I don't like that I like the fit with the Cubs and David Ross but I don't like the approach and sort of that that mentality um but I have a lot of respect for David Ross so it's no lower than a B but um I would have liked to see them bring in, um, you know, Bruce Bochy, um, you know, Joe Madden. I mean, retain Joe Madden, um, or which we will talk about for sure, or 
um, uh, you know, like a Ron Washington or, or whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's just, I like the fit, like I said, if that makes sense, but I don't like the approach, if that makes sense. The Giants fired Bruce Bochy. Okay. The Giants fired Bruce Bochy. That in and of itself, on the surface, doesn't sit well with me. Bruce Bochy is a legendary Giants manager. He's a Hall of Fame manager. He is... Um, he, he won them three World Series in the span of five years. Um, I mean, he's, he's done it all in San Francisco. And they've obviously fallen off in the last couple of years and I don't think he has a lot to do with that um he has said that he um is not interested in managing anymore but a lot of what I'm hearing is that he's kind of being forced out by the analytics movement he's a very old school kind of guy and it seems to me like if he had the opportunity to continue managing he would um, but I mean, maybe he, maybe he, that's completely honest and he, he would have retired regardless. Um, so to me, I, I get it. Like, I don't like letting him go. Um, I would have liked to see them push hard and try to, you know, get him to stay, but I get it. But then they, they hired Gabe Kapler. Now... I don't get that at all because he struggled in Philadelphia tremendously. He he clearly was not able I mean he I mean look, I mean I don't want to you know, I don't want to take anything away from Gabe Kapler, but he has not shown really that he has the ability to be um a high-level manager in this league and to me it's like you're the Giants, you're a rebuilding team. If you want to take a chance on somebody, take a chance on somebody that has a chance to do something special. Don't take a chance on somebody who has the chance to be average. And if if he continues at this pace, is is going to be not somebody you want uh, running your team. And it makes a lot of sense to me, to bring in a, a rookie, even um, somebody that, like, like we've talked about, kind of you can take a chance on. He can grow with the organization and the team, but this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, letting go of a legend and bringing in a guy who um, took over the Phillies with, you know, arguably some of the most talent in in the National League and wasn't able to get them over the hump. So I don't get it. Um, at all, and I don't think the, the Giants um, fan base right now is particularly pleased, and that's an F for me. I mean, I just, I it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, there's no way. And again, I'm not trying to take away um, anything from from Gabe Kapler, but you, the fact that Gabe Kapler is managing um, the San Francisco Giants over, you know, the likes of keeping a Bruce Bochy or like we talked about, a Ron Washington, a Joe Madden if he did leave the Cubs, which he did, um, a Buck Showalter, you know, just these these veteran, experienced, proven, a Joe Girardi, like they, they were talking about maybe even getting Joe Girardi managers that it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's an F. For me, I, I don't like the hiring at all. Maybe I'm wrong, but, um, and there's not a lot of, um, you know, he can't really, um, he can't really lose too much. I mean, they're going to be the worst team in baseball, in my opinion, with or without um, Gabe Kapler. So, I mean, he can't really go anywhere but up. Um, so I think he's sort of protected in that sense. But, man, I, I just don't get it. I just don't. Um, so it's an F. And then finally, we got the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. They fired Brad Osmus. Now, 
Um, look, I mean, the Angels for years have had Mike Trout and talent surrounding him. Um, you know, nothing special, but you know, they've had they've had talent, and they haven't done anything of note. Um, and I think that. You know, Brad Ausmus was put into a tough situation. You know, the secondary team in his market, um, a team that that had underperformed before he got there. He was very up and down in Detroit. Um, his records, his first season, he was ninety and seventy two, then they were seventy four and eighty seven, then back to eighty six and seventy five, and then finally sixty four and ninety eight in the season that he was let go. Um, so, I mean, up and down manager coming into an up and down team and it's, I get why they were letting him go. Um, I don't think he was given really a fair shot um, with either team. Um, but I, I mean, I, I mean, it seems to me like he's an average at best manager. Um, they bring in Joe Madden. Joe Madden to me is the best manager I've ever seen. Um, I'm 19 years old, so I, I don't have a tremendous um, you know, deal of, of, of experience um, with, you know, watching baseball and over the years and, and what have you. But Joe Madden, I mean, think about this for a second. He took the Tampa Bay Rays and he won a pennant. He took them to the World Series. He comes to the Chicago Cubs and he wins the first World Series in over a century. I mean, just think about that for a second. I mean, he, the, the Tampa Bay Rays have been, I mean, like one of their players, like like Tommy Pham, we talked about earlier. He he called out the fan base. I mean, they're just their fan base and their their market is so small. And he, Joe Madden comes in and he takes them to a he wins a pennant, and then he comes to the Cubs. And fresh off being one of the most, I mean, they were like the, you know, they were like the Sixers for a while, or like the Knicks. Like they were, they were like a Brown level, Browns level bad. Um, in, in, in baseball and, and he comes in and he wins the first World Series in over 100 years he, he's impressed me more than any other manager I've ever seen so I love uh, this hiring and you know the Angels have a lot of work to do um, in filling out you know their pitching uh, staff and bullpen and putting pieces around um, Trout and now of course Anthony Rendon to, to try to contend because obviously that's what they have their sights on and I think he's definitely the right man to to you know be be running the ship, um, writing the ship, running the ship. I don't know, whatever. But um, leading that team and, and that's a great hiring. And I'm I'm really impressed that they were able to get him. The Cubs. I mean, letting him go doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes sense to me. But I mean, I think the Angels are the winners of the uh, Angels and the Phillies, but really the Angels are the winners of the managerial firing, hiring cycle, like I, as I like to call it. Um, a plus for me. Um, there's nothing I don't like about Joe Madden. There's nothing I don't like about this hiring. They're a team that wants to win now, and they get you know, one of the best managers of all time to help them get there. Um, so it's an A+. Plus. Um, so that's all I got, really. It was a great first, a great first show. Tune back in um, again. Like I said, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today is a Friday, so you know. But um, so it's, this isn't going to be a regular thing. But um, you know, it's the first show. I just wanted to kind of get it out there. Um, so make sure you tune back in on Monday. But um, yeah, I mean that's. I mean you know, just to recap, um, Cody Bellinger is not going to stay with the Dodgers for the next you know six years. Um, and, and I think that he's um, a great player in an organization that is not on a good trajectory, in my opinion. Um, we got down to some, some postseason predictions um, and the managerial hire, firing, hiring cycle. Um, we talked about that as well. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and um, we'll be back at it on Monday. Um, and we'll get into some um, we'll get into some free agency stuff, um, and as the off season goes along, uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing some some rankings and power rankings and, and positional power rankings, and 
what have you leading up to the season. So, um, yeah, but uh, like I said, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it was a great first first show, and um, I'm really excited to, uh, to get going. So thank you so much for that, um, and peace out. Hope you enjoy.